Homeownership is dying, and we're becoming a renter nation because of a perfect storm of conditions that's making it increasingly hard for individuals to buy a home. There's a lot of factors causing this, but in this video, I'm going to analyze one of them, institutional homebuyers. Because in the history of real estate investing, it's relatively new for institutions to buy single-family homes, but the investment strategy itself was years in the making. Let's turn back the clock to the early to mid-2000s, when YouTube didn't exist and you could take out loans exceeding the value of your property with no money down. Easy debt led to a bacchanal of home buying and record levels of homeownership, followed by the great hangover of 2008. In the face of tightening credit and declining homeownership, a relatively small private equity fund called Treehouse Group started cleaning up the mess by buying up about a thousand distressed homes in Phoenix, Arizona for pennies on the dollar. And this was a great strategy by itself, but a few years later, Blackstone Group took notice and acquired the entire portfolio and branded it Invitation Homes. This was an unusual move because purchasing thousands of single-family homes didn't seem like a scalable business for one of the world's biggest private equity firms. Their typical portfolios are in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, so to deal with a bunch of individual homes scattered across the country looked like it was destined for quick liquidation when the market recovered. Except that wasn't the strategy at all. Blackstone understood that they had lots of advantages over the typical individual home buyer. Since they raise so much cash at once, they have options on how to acquire homes. They can close all cash if they really need to win, but they also use revolving lines of credit, kind of like a credit card, but with interest rates below 2%. Meaning that compared to an individual buyer with a 5% loan, they can bid a lot higher while still having the same monthly payment as that individual buyer. And also a revolving line of credit doesn't work like an amortized 30 year mortgage. They have the flexibility to pay principal and interest as needed instead of paying mostly interest up front. So, as interest rates continued falling and the housing market grew more competitive, Blackstone and other institutional buyers didn't mind paying closing prices slightly above market as long as they could hit a critical mass of homes, because they were planning decades ahead. They wanted to hold and build out economies of scale on a management business, because they understood that there would come a time when interest rates would come back up, which is basically happening right now, at which point a lot of first-time home buyers would get priced out of their target markets and the rental pool would grow and become more competitive. That in turn would increase their cash flows and just justify a higher valuation, giving them the option to refinance their entire portfolios and take cash out without ever selling any of the houses. Genius. But that didn't stop them from a frenzy of M&A activity instead of a traditional exit by selling. Since the founding of Invitation Homes, Cerberus created First Key Homes, Colony Capital created Colony American Homes, Colony American merged with Starwood Waypoint Residential Trust, Cerberus acquired more than 4,000 homes from BLT Homes, American Homes for Rent acquired American Residential Properties, and Invitation Homes merged with Starwood Waypoint. Yeah, I can't follow it either. More recently, BlackRock, not Blackstone, has been making headlines because they invested in a large stake of Invitation Homes. Between Invitation Homes and American Homes for Rent, they control nearly 60% of institutionally owned homes, and aside from a small blip during the pandemic lockdowns, institutional buying has steadily increased to a pace of over 80,000 homes being purchased per quarter. Time out. A lot of people like to point out that 80,000 homes is nothing compared to the 140 million housing units in this market. And on their blog, Invitation Homes also likes to point out how little impact they have on the market. They're like, don't look at us, our little business model is so little. And for the better part of the last decade, they've been pretty great at deflecting attention from this business plan. Also, credit to Zillow for their assist in creating distracting headlines when their eye-buying efforts failed spectacularly. And no, I'm not ignoring all those all-cash buyers migrating from tier one cities making the situation worse. But let me put the institutional home buying numbers in context for you. In a typical year, there's about 5 million sales of existing single-family homes. Compared to the 300,000 or so institutional purchases in the last 12 months, that's 6% of the transactions. Which still doesn't sound like it'd move the markets much, until you start slicing it up by the markets they're operating in. They have been very concentrated in specific metros that everyone's been trying to move to. In Atlanta, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Vegas, and Phoenix, they bought about 30% of all homes traded in the previous quarter. One in three homes. If you were buying one out of every three shares traded of a stock, you'd better believe you have an effect on its price. So in the markets that these institutional buyers operate, they have a significant impact on pricing. And if you're not in one of these markets that they operate in, that means the returns suck and they don't care to bother with your neighborhood. So no, they're not really moving the needle on the nationwide median pricing, but they do have a huge influence on the price action in the most popular markets. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not calling for regulation and this video isn't 
isn't meant to demonize private equity firms and institutional home buying. Some of these overheated cities may self-correct by enacting rent regulations, and tenant unions might form. But to date, institutions played by the rules and their strategy worked. If anything, I'm admiring their tactical brilliance and dissecting it for you. Because if we can apply the same type of thinking for the next couple decades, we can make a lot better real estate investment decisions. And that's precisely what I'm going to do in the next video. So hit that subscribe button.